Thank you all for being here. Don't applaud, just throw money. Um, I've been speaking, gosh, for several years on animal population control. I spent almost two years working for the Global Alliance for Rabies Control as a veterinary outreach coordinator and spoke at most of the U.S. veterinary schools. And, and I've learned two things about giving a presentation. Perhaps I should have learned more, but two very important points. One, never give a presentation after a meal. You know, those bagels were pretty good this morning. And never give a presentation after Joyce Briggs. It's a hard act to follow. So I'm going to follow up on what Joyce um, has been talking about in a specific area of non-surgical sterilization. And somebody asked the question earlier, um, what happened to Neutersol? And we're going to uh, talk a little bit about this. But uh, uh, before we get started, I want to pose the question, why do we neuter dogs? So they don't reproduce. So they don't reproduce. Common beliefs are it's healthier for the dogs to change behavior. Um, and as somebody in the audience said, so they don't reproduce. So we're going to come back to that. <coughs> Little schedule for today. I'm going to introduce the product Zuterin. Many of you have heard of it. Uh, talk a little bit about efficacy and safety. We'll talk about how it got its approval, some of the research, expected reactions, treating potential adverse reactions. Fortunately, they don't occur very frequently. Long term effects, behavioral issues. Somebody asked a question. Uh, I hope that person is, is here, uh, asked a question about uh, behavior, and we'll address that. Um, there are a number, how many? Uh, Joyce asked, how many veterinarians we have in the room? Okay, quite a few. How many of you are members of the Association of Shelter Veterinarians? So you have seen some of the dialogue on the listserv about this product, and I'm going to answer specifically some of the questions that have been posed on the Shelter Vet listserv. Um, the question comes up, how do we identify dogs that have been zinc neutered, and a few current uses uh, and tips. I always put this slide in to promote the ACC and D. I always ask when I was when I started speaking for GARC back in 2009, I was an advocate for animal population control and rabies prevention, and I would ask students at veterinary schools, "How many of you have heard of the ACC and D?" Zero to one hand would go up. And now, when I give presentations at veterinary schools on Zuterin, I have this slide in and say, "How many people have heard of the ACC and D?" And lots of hands go up. So it's really cool to see how our profession is learning about the potential for non-surgical forms of sterilization and contraception. I'm not going to ask how many have heard of the ACCND because if you were in Joyce's presentation, you heard all about it. Joyce mentioned some of the ACCND missions and resources that we have, and, and I want to bring one of them to your attention the Asterosol slash Zuterin product profile and position paper. This is a summary done by the ACCND, an unbiased uh, organization. Uh, no propaganda in there. It's all looking at the science of the product. So if you want information, unbiased information, on Zuterin, also known as um, Asterosol internationally, Zuterin in the U.S., Go to the ACCND website. This is freely downloadable. This is a great resource to learn more about this product. Zuterin is basically zinc gluconate neutralized with arginine. It is the only FDA approved non-surgical sterilant for male dogs. A single virtually painless injection to neuter a male dog permanently. And, and we're going to address that because one of the questions on the ASV listserv was, how do we know it's painless? We'll get to that. Um, it's FDA approved for male dogs three to 10 months of age. There is data submitted to the FDA to increase that uh, upper end to three months and older. And also work looking at the use of this product in dogs, male dogs that are two to three months of age. How many of you all neuter two month old male puppies? You see, so there's a little bit of a disconnect there because if you're in a shelter surgically sterilizing two month old males, but you can't use Zuterin until they're three months of age. So the idea is to get that age down to where it's consistent with surgery. 
It is uh, a one-time injection into each testicle, safe and effective, and we're going to address all of these things. It is permanent and irreversible. Again, another question on the shelter vet listserv was, well, how do we know it's permanent? We're going to talk about that. It does reduce testosterone, not to the extent that surgical castration does. And that may or may not be a good thing, depending on your perspective, and I'm going to give you some scientific evidence on that. So quick key points on Zuterin. Injection technique is very important. Um, the problem with Nutrisol was it was marketed through distributors. Veterinarians were not trained on how to use it, and they just started injecting. And I have, I'm going to show you a training video here in a few minutes that uh, was shot at Western <coughs> University College of Veterinary Medicine. And in that video, I'm training the faculty there, and I pop the top off a vial and I drink it. Well, the FDA made them take it out of that because it's not, <laughs> not designed for oral use. The point is, you know, it is, it, you, you can drink it. It's, it's, when you have a, a cold, what do you take? Zinc gluconate. I think it's called Zycam, okay? You can drink it. You can pour it on your hand. Doesn't hurt. Inject it under the skin, which I've done, it burns. So injection technique is incredibly important because the idea is it, it's, it's painless. If injected into the testicular parenchyma, if it leaks outside of the testicular parenchyma into that subscrotal tissue, it will cause irritation. The problem with Nutrisol was veterinarians were not trained on proper injection technique and they were getting leakage. Dogs were getting irritated. They were licking excessively, causing scrotal ulceration. So injection technique is key. And, and we'll talk specifically about slow technique and, and how to properly do it. The mechanism, it, it causes sclerosis of seminiferous tubules. It does not damage the Leydig cells. It does reduce testosterone, but not by a direct effect on the Leydig cells, by inhibition of that feedback loop that Joyce showed in her presentation. Since there's not sperm being produced, then there's less LH being produced to stimulate testosterone production, about 50% when compared to surgical castration. Uh, Post-injection, it's zinc and arginine. These are natural products. 1.1% of animals needed to be treated for post-injection reaction, very low. Um, and the recent experience that Arc Sciences has is even better. Less than 1% of dogs have uh, any sort of adverse reaction. And from a shelter perspective, one of the key points is efficiency. Time. I know that those of you that are doing pediatric neuters are probably very fast surgeons, which is cool. But if you don't need general anesthesia, then you really are much more efficient in terms of time because these animals are, if you give them, say, dextomator or something like that, um, you can triage them. And one of my training experiences uh, at Spay Neuter Kansas City, we had set up a whole triage where the, you know, the, the animals were examined and the technicians were weighing and pre-medicating and the veterinarians were coming along and measuring and injecting. And, and we did like, like 20 animals in you know, half an hour's time. It was just incredibly efficient. And the recovery, you reverse the dextomator with uh, anacedin and they, 15 minutes later they were up, walked out the door. And so spay neuter, mobile spay neuter programs initially would say, well, you know, we've got such a, a fine-tuned system. I don't think we're going to use this because we'd have to reinvent, you know, our protocol. But then they got thinking about it. You know what? We could do the Zuterin dogs first, send them home, free up some cage space so we can do more females. So it, it is incredibly efficient. It's incredibly safe because it doesn't require general anesthesia. Then you know, the risk of unexplained anesthetic death in dogs, what I've seen published, is one dog in 1,800. So you totally obviate that. Cost, you know, the syringe, a couple of syringes, a couple of needles, some chemical restraint, some zuterin, you're looking, you know, $25, $30 a dog. And uh, uh, the throughput time is so much shorter. Again, you don't have to tie up cage space. You can, you can literally do this on an outpatient basis. Um, it has been proven safe and effective. The FDA, the original data, said 99.6% uh, efficacy, 223 out of 224 dogs. One dog was oligospermic, but did have sperm, 
So the FDA said, well, you know, he's, he's not azoospermic. So one dog out of 224. But uh, it, it is incredibly uh, effective. Now, one of the questions on the ASV listserv is how do we know that it's permanent? And uh, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time with this. There are references that describe histopathologic evidence that you can use as a basis of regulatory action. Also, they look at endpoints to determine sterility. And I want to point out that uh, the absence of a tubular lumen, uh, absence of elongated spermatids, and the height of the germinal epithelium as well as tube diameter. So if you look at histopath sessions, sections, these are epididymi, uh, or epididymides. Like, <laughs> I even practiced that word. Epididymides, there you go. Um, of an untreated dog on the left, and you can see the height of the columnar epithelium, and you can see sperm in the lumen. This is a dog treated with zuterin, 30 days post-treatment. Notice the epithelium is much more flattened, and there's nada in the, uh, in the lumen. So, you know, posted that on the ASV listserv. Person wrote back and said, well, how do you know it doesn't, you know, regenerate? All right, this is epididymis for an untreated dog. Again, a little bit higher magnification. You see the sperm in the lumen, columnar epithelium. Uh, 24 months post-injection. Notice the amount of fibrous tissue in here, the height of the, of the epithelium, and nothing in the lumen. That's 24 months. Here's testicle uh, from an untreated dog on the left. You can see the normal progression of, of cells uh, in the development of sperm. And you don't have to be a histopathologist to see that there is no normal seminiferous tubular structure here. This is all fibrous tissue at 24 months post-injection. Now, posted that on the ASV list, sir. Person wrote back, well, how do you know it doesn't reverse itself? Well, I mean, these are good questions. Uh, Dr. Min Wang, one of the, the uh, MDs from China who originally developed this product was posed this question and he said it should be noted that unfortunately or in this case fortunately the body does not reverse fibrosis and there's no known treatment to recover fibrotic seminiferous tubules of the testes which renders the animal permanently sterile a claim that the FDA has approved based on the evidence presented so after 24 months there was no regeneration and there's no evidence that regeneration will ever occur. Question on the ASV listserv, how do we know that it is safe? Now I'm not going to read this to you, it's an Arc Sciences Company statement. They just cite the data that one dog in 200, when the protocol, injection protocol is followed, will have some sort of an adverse reaction, which is a very low number actually. Um, and they go on to say a total of nine cases of scrotal ulceration were reported. Uh, that resolve safely either via surgery or medical management. And Brian, I, how many dogs are you up to now? Like 1,200 or? Yeah, we got the, the latest numbers are actually 2,200. 2,200? Man, where have I been? Under a rock? Uh, wow, 2,200. And, and how many adverse reactions? Uh, we have about 16. 16? So, you know, that's, uh, that's less than 1%. That's, that's pretty impressive. When the injection technique is followed, uh, um, properly, and that's why I keep harping on it. I'm going to show you guys that because I really, if you choose to use this, I want you to have good outcomes. You know, one of the things I like about Arc Sciences, and, and just for, um, in the interest of transparency, I do not work for Arc Sciences. Um, I get no uh, compensation from them. I am on the ACC and D board, and if I were to work for Arc Sciences, I would have to resign my position on the ACC and D board, and I don't want to do that. So um, I'm here because I really believe the evidence. Uh, that it uh, is a great product. I know these people, they want to help solve the problem of animal overpopulation, but not at the expense of individual animals. And I know that you all feel the same way. Uh, research behind the FDA approval, there, I mentioned there were 224 dogs. They did a, uh, actually 12 years of scientific research, dosage determination study, animal safety study, um, clinical trial, follow-up dogs in the original study. Interesting thing they found in terms of adverse reactions. 
Notice number one on, on the adverse reaction, scrotal pain, 17 dogs um, out of a total of 270. This includes the 224 and some others that, that didn't complete the study. Um, there's a little asterisk there. No NSAIDs were used and most scrotal pain was reported within the first two days. As a result of that, the company recommends a concomitant administration of an NSAID and, and when I train veterinarians and veterinary students, we always give them an NSAID. And the, the veterinarians that I have trained that are now using this product and follow up with, they, they say that, that they never see any significant pain uh, post-injection. I think the NSAID has really helped them. Some other real small uh, numbers that occur, and I think maybe, you know, some of the, like scrotal irritation may have progressed to scrotal ulceration, who knows. But very small numbers here. This was in the original uh, FDA trial. So as a result of all that, the ARC um, Sciences Deuteron Training Manual, which I believe those of you who, uh, how many of y'all are coming to the demonstration this, uh, uh, this afternoon? Okay, a few. Those of you that were signed up got a copy of the training manual, and I'm happy to get you one if you see me afterwards. Uh, but, um, you know, if there's scrotal irritation, a little anti-inflammatory antibiotic ointment, e-collar is your friend uh, to keep the dog from licking. If it gets worse and ulcerates, antibiotics, a little bit more aggressive uh, therapy. And sometimes these, if, if the ulceration becomes really, really severe and it looks like it's potentially getting infected and abscessing, um, some veterinarians may choose to do a scrotal ablation. That's why they call it practice. You know, I do things differently than you do. Uh, neither one's necessarily right, but all the ones that I've been involved with, we have been able to manage medically. But some veterinarians will say, well, let's go ahead and do a scrotal ablation and, and be done with it. You know, that's, that's your choice, but uh, we want to do what's best for the animals. Many of these, if they do occur in very small numbers, can be managed quite nicely medically. Um, expected reactions, I keep harping, you guys can get tired of me hearing that injection technique is critical. Um, normal reactions that you can expect if you use this product, generally non-painful swelling for the first 24 to 48 hours. The testicles will be a little bit swollen. There's inflammation going on there and, and they, they, they do swell up a little bit. They're typically, if you palpate them, non-painful. The dogs don't seem to mind. Um, listlessness for the first 24 hours, that's, that's really an interesting thing because I, I think that there's, since I don't work for Arc Sciences, I can say this. I think there's a, a great off-label use for this in pocket pets. I've done a ton of guinea pigs and rats. I haven't done any rabbits yet, and I'm thinking about, I'm thinking about trying this in rabbits because how many of y'all neuter rabbits? How many of you had problems with uh, uh, hernia afterwards, huh? You know, how cool would it be to be able to inject and, uh, but the point is, I think there's a niche market for pocket pets. Guinea pigs, you know, I, I think they're kind of an anesthetic nightmare. And, and I've injected a number of guinea pigs. I had students that had guinea pigs and they kept reproducing, so we injected them, wait 30 days, put them back in, and, and nine months, a year later, no more little guinea piglets. So uh, I think there's a, a, a whole niche market for that, but it's kind of interesting. The guinea pig owners and the rat owners all reported listlessness for 24 hours. And I told them, we see this in dogs, they're just kind of quiet and, and not as active. And the rat owner called me, she goes like, it was right at 24 hours. It's like somebody flipped the switch and the rats started doing rat stuff again. Um, <laughs> so uh, you'll see that and just warn the owners, just let them know, these, you know the animal's going to be a little listless for 24 hours. Um, some people report vomiting during the first 24 hours, oftentimes it's seen more frequently. I don't know the mechanism behind that. I don't know whether it's sedative related or zuterin related, but the vomiting was reported in the FDA trial and a lot of those dogs were not done with, chemi with any chemical restraint. I've done tons of dogs with no chemical restraint whatsoever. It, it really is non-painful. Non um, but most of the dogs, I'd say that 99.99% within 24 hours are, are, are back to normal. So how do we know that it's, it's painless? And, and we could make some jokes here, you know. Um, but, and I actually, when I submitted an IACUC uh, proposal, it got kicked back because I, when they said under pain management, I said not necessary. 
no pain sensors in testicular parenchyma. And the, the person wrote me back and said, my boyfriend would disagree with you. <laughs> I want to see a reference. So I got her a reference. There are pressure sensors. There are pain fibers in the, the capsule. But in the testicular parenchyma, there are pressure sensors. They are not uh, pain sensors. So if you're a guy, this is limited to the guys in the room, and you're playing basketball, and you know what happens when you play basketball, that pain that you're feeling is from the capsule pain sensors as well as the pressure sensors. So slow injection technique is, is why we, we don't want to trip those, those pressure sensors. So, uh, I, like I said, I have done, uh, gosh, I wish I'd totaled up the number, probably well over 100 dogs with no chemical restraint whatsoever. And they just lay there. Now, obviously, the skin of the scrotums is exquisitely sensitive. But using a small gauge, like 30 gauge needle, once you get through the skin, the dog doesn't mind at all and a slow injection technique does not trip the pressure sensor. So, um, so it, it truly is painless. Um, Long-term effects, Arc Sciences has, um, they followed 36-month-old uh, dogs for two years, uh, two years of routine evaluations. Uh, they sampled testosterone and found a permanent reduction of circulating testosterone, about 50%. 24 months post-injection, uh, the animals were necropsied and histopath was done. The uh, epididymides, hey, how'd I do? <laughs> uh, the epididymides, uh, testicles, and prostate all had reduced size in the zooterin treated dogs. Um, so going back to our questions, why do we neuter dogs? It's healthier for the dog, is it? There's been some stuff, if you read the literature lately, that's calling that into question. Um, and we know that testosterone is important for a lot of metabolic functions. We also know that uh, because the dog is not producing sperm, that feedback mechanism, testosterone decreases by 41 to 52 percent. But there is some there available for other metabolic functions. Now, if you haven't seen this article, I'm happy to provide you with a copy. Um, it was in JAVMA, uh, December of 2007, determining the optimal age for gonadectomy uh, of dogs and cats. Um, and it looks at the long-term effects of animals that are spayed or neutered uh, based on the age that they were spayed and neutered. And now, it, it is certainly, there are a lot of small print, you don't have to just put this on here because it was in the article, but it is clearly uh, breed specific, a lot of these things. But we know clearly the benefits of, of castration include preventing testicular tumors because the testicles aren't there anymore. Um, also preventing BPH, benign prostatic hypertrophy, or prostatitis. So we know that we can prevent those things by castration. But what's interesting to look at now, we know that the reported complications from castration surgery are 6.1%, significantly higher than the complications from zuterin. And also, we know prostatic neoplasia is more prevalent in neutered male dogs than it is intact male dogs. And again, depending on the breed, some of these things are now starting to show up. Obesity, uh, cruciate ligament injuries, certain types of uh, of neoplasia are more prevalent in, uh, or reportedly more prevalent in uh, neutered males. Now the thing of it is, we don't know at what cut point that reduction in testosterone would impact this. Obviously there's a lot of work that needs to be done, but the point and one of the conclusions of her article, and I think it's a really great article, is that in a shelter setting, our overarching concern is animal population control. You know, there was a saying back in the 70s, if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem, and, and shelters that don't sterilize prior to adoption are going to see animals coming back. So we want to get these guys sterilized and out of there as quickly, as safely, and as efficiently as possible. And that was one, that's a conclusion of her article, but she also said in private practice, you know, maybe 
Neutering a male dog at eight weeks of age is not in that individual animal's best interest. So depending on what the animal's going to be used for, a uh, sporting dog for, or whatever, you know, she argues that the veterinarian should counsel the owners on sterilization, but maybe at a, a, a little bit later date. So again, the, the data is nowhere near conclusive, um, and it'll be interesting to see at what effect um, you know, that reduction of testosterone that's not as significant as castration, what effect that has. We neuter dogs to change behavior. Is the person who asked the question in the last, uh, uh, and I guess not, uh, I don't remember exactly the question, but say it had to do with testosterone behavior. And the question I have is, why do we think that castration changes behavior? Okay. Why do we think castration reduces aggression? Okay. Because we've always been told that. Now, here are, and I'm going to get to your, that, that's a very good question, a very good comment, and we're going to get to that in just a second. These are some anecdotal statements uh, provided by Arc Sciences that during the FDA clinical trial, one of the uh, caretakers uh, observed that the dogs treated with zinc gluconate are much calmer than uh, compared to intact male dogs. Now, there's obviously no, you know, it's not statistically significant. This is anecdotal. Max stopped urine marking and now sits in her lap. And Max is a cool little dog in an Arc Sciences video that's, he was done at the Sawa convention. Really cute little fuzzy faced dog. Um, and, and, but the owner said, you know, he's no longer peeing in the house and sits in, in her lap. Tank stopped digging the garden and became cuddly. <laughs> Way to go, Tank. <laughs> I have no idea who Tank is. But these are anecdotal things. Okay, we can do anecdotal all day long. But, oh, and, and this is, I really like this one. This is uh, uh, observations during the FDA study resulted in this statement. Uh, approved by the FDA. As with surgical castration, secondary male characteristics, roaming, marking, aggression, or mounting may be displayed. That's like saying I only drink when I'm with someone or by myself. <laughs> you know, but basically what this means is it's a statement of equivalency that um, the effects you see from uh, zuterin are no different than from surgical castration. Now, I. <laughs> I borrowed some slides from my friend. How many of you guys know James Serple at UPenn? Great guy, great guy. Has forgotten more about behavior than I know. I am not a behaviorist. Um, but, so he let me borrow some of these because this comes up, this has come up on the ASV listserv a lot. And this is what we think we know. And these are some quotes that James has gotten from veterinary clinic websites, humane societies, uh, trainers, and animal shelters. And, and I, I love this one. Female dogs, like males, have an increased risk of aggression if left intact. Really? Okay. What does the original evidence show? This was a study that was published in 1997. And it did show that, yes, there was some, a decrease, significant decrease in intermale aggression, significant decrease in peeing in the house. Didn't work in my male dog. But, it's a very small sample size. It's only a quasi-random sample um, derived from veterinary clinic records of dogs castrated in the previous six to 12 months. Most of the dogs were castrated for behavior problems. So you have a, an expectation bias. There was no control group to compare. So there's no way to know if the reported effects were due to the surgery. It was a retrospective phone survey. Owners were asked to remember the dog's behavior prior to surgery and compare with post-surgical behavior. Again, there might be a recall bias there. And the owners were only given three choices. Behavior increased, behavior stayed the same, behavior decreased. So Serple summarized the original evidence that yes, neutering has some positive effects on sexual mounting, roaming, urine marking, 
and aggression directed towards other intact male dogs. But it has minor to negligible effects on all other aspects of behavior. He has since been accumulating data that I believe will be published soon using the CBARC. Are you all familiar with CBARC, Canine Behavioral Assessment Research Questionnaire, uh, to compare the reported incidence of behavior problems among spayed, neutered uh, versus intact dogs. His findings are pretty interesting. If you look at dog-directed aggression or fear, the sterilized group are the darker here, male and female, compared to the lighter group, intact, you can see that there's a statistically significant difference that the sterilized animals have higher scores on dog-directed aggression and fear, owner-directed aggression and fear, and, and, and I can see that in my little dog. Again, an animal one is not statistically significant, but he pees in the house, and when he goes under the bed to avoid going in the crate, and I try to pull him out, he will become aggressive towards his owner, uh, and he has been neutered. Serpel also looked at touch sensitivity, and there's a statistically significant difference in both males and females, as well as non-social fear. Uh, now, this is data that he has compiled. And again, I, I'm not a behaviorist. He's allowed me to share this. If anybody has questions that I probably can't answer, I'm happy to put you in touch with him. But I think this is really interesting to look at, that we always think that, that sterilizing, whether it's with Zuterin or with surgery, uh, improves behavior. And he's got some data now that says, what was it, Lee Corso on ESPN? Not so fast. Uh, so behavior conclusions, yes, surgical neutering, or perhaps as the data comes out, uh, sterilization with zuterin, may reduce specific male hormone dependent behaviors, sexual mounting, roaming, urine marking, and aggression directed towards other intact males uh, that have already learned these behaviors. Surgical sterilization may increase other undesirable behaviors owner-directed aggression, touch sensitivity, fearfulness, et cetera, in otherwise behaviorally normal animals. Now, as with virtually anything in science, one or two studies rarely cause, you know, a conclusion. So definitive conclusions will require prospective controlled studies. And, and I think it's, interested that, it's interesting that we're, we're looking at the, the topic of behavior, whether it's with surgery or with Zuterin, and I think hopefully there will be data generated now that, that Zuterin is coming out to compare with sterilized animals as well as intact animals, so we'll get some answers to these questions. All right, administration, how are we doing on time? Um, testicles measured with a, a caliper, the, you can't probably see it in the back of the room, but the, the, the dose is based on the width of the testicle. It's how the dose is determined. It's for uh, uh, up to, uh, it's like 31 millimeters of width. I don't have a, a caliper with me, but uh, um, the video, training video shows uh, how to measure. Gently cleanse and disinfect the scrotum. And the dog's heads here, you, you, the testicle is injected from the cranial pole, just ventral to the dog's laying on its back, of course, ventral to the head of the epididymis and directed into the center of the testicle. Does that make anybody squeamish? Yeah? Oh my gosh. How many of you have injected a testicle in the last week? Lidocaine? Yeah. How many of you have given an injection of any kind in the last week? Yeah. We don't normally inject testicles. It's not a normal thing to do. And, and, and my friend and mentor, Carlos Escoval in Mexico, who trained me and has probably injected more dogs with Zuterin than anyone in the world, um, tells a funny story. He says, yeah, you know, when I train male veterinarians, their hands are shaking. <laughs> <clears throat> and I'm going to try to do this with Carlos's accent because it's really kind of cool. He says, but the women, they go, yeah! <laughs> so, um, injecting a testicle is not something that we routinely do. And it, it takes a little getting used to. So, 
Somebody asked in Joyce's thing, what happened to Nutrisol? And I mentioned earlier that injection technique has been really scrutinized. And I've worked with Arc Sciences um, as an unpaid consultant for, gosh, over three years now. And one of the things I have helped them with is their injection technique. And probably the most important thing is we're using three needles now, one to withdraw product into two syringes, and then two brand new needles to inject. How many of you have drawn up like Ketval to give IV? And there's a little ketamine in the end of that needle. When you go through the skin, the cat or dog jumps. That's what we're talking about here. We don't want any product in that needle. So um, brand, two new, brand new needles to inject. Timed injection, slow. And you'll see in the video, I, I, I train veterinarians like a tenth of an ml per second. You know, one 1,000, two 1,000, or sing, I've been working on the railroad, or happy birthday to you, or whatever it is, to slow down. You know, the crazy Labrador retriever puppy that you have in the exam room, that you want to get that needle in, aspirate, and vaccinate, and then get out. That's not how we do this. We don't aspirate because we don't want to pull testicular parenchyma up into the needle and trigger those pressure sensors. And we don't inject rapidly, we inject slowly. Because if you inject rapidly, it'll leak out the injection track and as well as trip those pressure sensors. So it's really, really important. Uh, oh, I mentioned do not um, aspirate prior to injecting. And the other thing is, when you're done injecting, don't immediately withdraw. Allow that product to start to diffuse throughout the parenchyma and allow the pressure to equilibrate in the testicular parenchyma and then withdraw the needle and let go of the testicle. And do not massage. That, you know, we give the crazy lab puppy the shot, we massage the area. You don't want to do that because you don't want to do anything that's going to potentially increase uh, pressure in the, in the testicle. Oh, this is a training video produced by Arc Sciences. Uh, so actually a retraining video. Um, so you examine the, the scrotal skin. Contraindications are scrotal dermatitis or um, cryptorchidism. You measure the width of the testicle. This is old. It was 10 to 27. I think it's been changed, what, 10 to 31 now or 33, something like that. So they recommend cleansing the scrotal area with chlorhexidine. Um, iodophores and alcohol tend to increase irritation. So cleanse with like chlorhexidine scrub and then rinse with chlorhexidine solution. Um, as I said, use a separate needle to draw the product into the syringes and then put a, a new needle on there. This does have, um, supposed to have video, but, uh, or not video, audio, but uh, it's not coming through. Um, I always, when I train, I do the right testicle first, dog's on its back, I lay the right syringe over here, left syringe here. If somebody interrupts you and you get, come back and it's like, oh, which one did I do? I have the left one left. So I always do the right one first. You wanna hold the syringe like a dart Without your finger on the plunger, you don't want to do anything to have product in that needle while you're passing through the skin. There's Carlos. I'm talking about the lever arm effect. If you hold the syringe way far back, a little motion creates a lot of motion. So you want to hold it kind of in the middle. And um, yeah, I, I don't like this where it says hold the scrotal skin tight. I, I don't want any real pressure on the testicle. I just sort of stabilize it and in, in, inject from the cranial pole. You can feel the head of the epididymis and you want to come in just ventral to it along the long axis of the testicle right into the center. And then slow injection time. 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, 1,004, so on and so forth. And when you get to the end of the injection, stop, relax, allow that pressure to equilibrate, and then you withdraw and release simultaneously. That's all there is to it. 
Arc Sciences recommends uh, tattooing. We're going to talk about tattooing um, in just a second. Using an NSAID to reduce the incidence of pain. Okay. That video, if anybody's interested, I'll provide you a link to it. It's available on um, YouTube. I see people furiously writing, so I'll, this, I'll leave the slide. I'm happy to give it to you. Or, yeah, you can write. Yes, ma'am. What's the largest volume you've ever injected? So what's a typical volume? One, one ml is the largest volume, uh, up to 31 mil, millimeters of width. I can tell you off-label, when I was in the Dominican Republic, I had dogs that were over that that I used 1 ml. And they, the company has some, they're looking at data right now with a 1 ml max, how far or how big a testicle can they inject with 1 ml. The vial comes in a 3 ml vial. The average, uh, my experience has been about half an ml per testicle. So you can get three dogs out of a vial. So. Any, any other questions? Yes. That, that's, that data has been submitted to the FDA uh, and it's under review right now and they expect, uh, um, I've heard conditional uh, approval, but Brian, do you care to answer that? Do you know when that's going to? Uh, Brian's with Arc Sciences, by the way. We anticipate getting uh, clearance in four months, so November for adult dogs. Yeah, and then the next big thing is going to be getting the two to three month data. Anybody else have a question? I've, I neglected to say you can interrupt me at any time. And, and I was just going to add that it's approved in with four other countries or, or more for um, uh, adult dogs as well. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Thank you, Joyce. Yes, ma'am. How long after the injection is the animal considered sterile? Good question. How long after the injection is the animal considered sterile? Zinc is actually instantaneously spermicidal. Um, and that fibrosis starts to occur during that initial 24 to 48 hour period, which is why the testicles are, are, you know, swollen. But Arc Sciences says that as with a castrated male, they can still, there can still be sperm in other parts of the reproductive tract, uh, they say 30 days to, uh, to consider the animal completely sterile. That's a great question. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, the, very good question. What is the uh, effect on the size of the testicle? My experience has been that in young dogs, those in the two to three month age that are treated, the testicles don't really develop to a normal size. An adult dog where the testicles are already developed, they will atrophy to some extent, become more firm, more fibrotic, but, uh, and you know, smaller, but there'll still be obvious testicles there. And this is going to be an important point for practicing veterinarians. Um, somebody adopts a, a dog from a shelter and they're examining it and says, wait a minute, they didn't neuter this dog. And, 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 and I mean, how many of you all have done pediatric scrotal approaches and had somebody adopt the dog and they take it to the vet and they said, oh, they did this wrong? You know, it's going to take a little bit of education uh, of the veterinarians in the community to, uh, uh, to understand how, what it is, how it works. Yes, ma'am. Is there any reason that um, organizations Is there any information on the rate of the possibility the NSAID affects the rate of fibrosis? Um, I don't know that that's been looked at. Um, that's a that's a good question. I, I Brian, do you, have you guys looked at that at all? So, there you go. All right, so anybody else? And we'll continue on. Can we get this in Canada? Can we get this in Canada? No. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I, 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 I might have a good source for you. See me afterwards. <laughs> All right, so a question comes up. How do we identify? Gosh, you guys are brilliant. You're a step ahead of me. Um, how do we identify dogs? Microchip companies do have a place in their database to record the zinc neutered status of dogs. You saw in the, um, in the video the tattoo. I thought it was just a marketing gimmick, actually, but it really, um, um, you know, if you look at it one way, it's an N, turn it 90 degrees, it's a Z. And then every dog gets a unique collar tag. 
They've got some other cool things like bandanas and shirts. You know, dogs with balls are ostracized at the dog park. <laughs> so they have this, these really cool shirts and bandanas. You know, I've been zinc neutered, so you know, don't ostracize me. But here's a picture. Uh, this is a Z tattoo. If you turn it this way, it's an uh, or this way, it's an N for neutered. This way, it's a Z. I thought it was a marketing gimmick, but it's kind of grown on me. All right, uh, real world, um, save time for questions. It's been used all over the world. I was involved in this project when I worked for GARC uh, in the Dominican, but it's been used uh, um, literally all over the world as a sterosol. And these are some pictures from the Dominican. We trained uh, Dr. Medina, the local veterinarian, um, on how to use it. It was interesting because I went down there, there was a rabies outbreak in a small community, and the government's response to that was, to come in and poison the community dogs. Now these are dogs that are known and recognized and valued members of the community by the residents. So when the government came in and started poisoning them, they, the residents hid them and, and didn't trust the government. So we came in and we were vaccinating and sterilizing, but in, in Latin cultures, they don't castrate dogs. They want them to have the family jewels. But they readily accepted Zuterin. And, it, and the government saw that they accepted it and then incorporated it in part of their national anti-rabies campaign. So it was really cool. Uh, here in the United States, um, there was an article in the September 2009 issue of Science uh, called A Cure for Euthanasia. If you haven't read this, uh, I'd be happy to provide you with a copy. It's a great, great article about the quest to develop uh, a true non-surgical sterile, it talks about the Michelson Prize and grants and how that has been such a shot in the arm for the, the field of non-surgical sterilants. Um, it, it really, I think, you know, I, I just showed a slide about international use, but I, I think there's, there is a need here in, in the United States in shelters. Uh, Zuterin training, this is an updated map provided by Arc Sciences of all the places where trainings have occurred in the United States and they're increasing um, how many are you up to now, 200 and? Uh, yeah, that, that map's 117 certified. Okay. Um, and, and I've been involved with a couple of these trainings, but, uh, um, and, and hopefully tonight, if we have three dogs, uh, it's possible that a veterinarian could get certified. It takes three dogs to get certified. And I think we have three dogs. Yes, ma'am. You know, that's a really good question. I'm glad you asked that because um, we know that this product doesn't eliminate circulating testosterone. It reduces it, uh, at least in dogs, by about half. And I'm wondering if there's not a place for this with feral cats in terms of rendering them sterile but still wanting to copulate and cats being induced ovulators than if a, a sterilized male cat copulates with a female and she ovulates but doesn't conceive, then maybe that'll help reduce fecundity. That's a good question. I know it's being looked at. There's a paper that's about to be published out of Brazil, uh, and I believe one out of Italy, looking at uh, the use of this product in cats. So yeah, I, originally I wasn't excited about it because I mean, I can neuter a cat in 35 seconds. You know, it takes me longer to draw a product. But you know, if feral cats you'd probably truly have to anesthetize because they're not gonna sit still for this. <laughs> and if you're gonna tip their ear, but if you could inject them, then you don't have to worry about bleeding postoperatively. You don't have to worry uh, you know, about infection. And, and so yes, I, I'm, I'm starting to change my thinking about the use of this product in feral cats. And I wanna see some of the data that comes out of these studies that are about to be published because if it doesn't significantly reduce testosterone to the point where they will still copulate, then there may be a place in terms of preventing you know, reproduction. The flip side of that is, well, you know, if they still have testosterone, they're gonna fight and be territorial and their urine's gonna stink. I don't know, at what level does that affect, you know, the reduction in testosterone affect that? But, you know, I guess my answer would be stay tuned because I think people are gonna look at it, so. Um, yeah, this is just a sample of places around the country that uh, uh, have been trained and are using it. I know, I was just in Portland, um, and I was involved in training the folks at Spay Neuter Kansas City. Just 
They, they really have embraced this product. And there's a demographic group in virtually every community that has, <coughs> excuse me, the pit bulldog that doesn't want him to be emasculated. But they readily accept this. They don't care if they can reproduce. You know, and it's, so it's, it's, it's really been kind of exciting to see how it's been accepted. Um, this is one of my favorite slides when I talk to veterinary students because um, how many older veterinarians like, like me do we have in here? <laughs> you know, we didn't even hear about this when we were in veterinary school. It's like they told us something, we believed it. And, you know, I really, uh, evidence-based decision making you know, the conscientious, explicit, and judicious use of current best evidence in making decisions about the care of individual patients. You know, looking at the scientific evidence. One of Whedon's laws is minds are like parachutes. They only function when they're open. And, and I've, I've been totally dismissed by veterinarians when I do a presentation. I was at the uh, Virginia Federation of Humane Societies last year, did a presentation. A veterinarian came up to me and said, I'm not going to use your product. So it's not my product, but I'm curious why. Well, I make too much money doing surgery. <laughs> really? How much money do you make? Well, I charge $150 and I make $75 of surgery. Yeah? How many do you do an hour? Two. Okay, so you're making 150 bucks an hour. Okay, that's not bad. If you could do five Zuterans in the time that you do those two surgical castrations and it costs you 25 bucks a dog, you market it at half the price of your surgical castration, $75, you're making 50 bucks a dog. The guy literally finished my sentence. Oh, I could make 250 bucks an hour. <laughs> so that's the whole thing about minds are like parachutes. They only function when they're open. I'm just, I tell veterinary students, I'm telling you guys, look at the evidence. You know, this may not be for everybody. And, and, and as Joyce said, these are tools. These are tools for, for a toolbox. So um, I just hope that, that you will look at the evidence and, oh, here's, how many of y'all know America's Veterinary? Or heard of America's Veterinary? Um, when I was in vet school, I was told half of what you learn here will turn out to be wrong. But no one knows which half. <laughs> and, and, you know, he's gone on to say that, that, that uh, one of the things we may have gotten wrong uh, was looking at the health impacts of neutering. All right, implementing, I already kind of mentioned this, you know, community readiness, educating local veterinarians, letting rescue groups know, letting people know, um, getting yourself trained, uh, being certified, understanding how it works, setting up a, a, a flow, and that's part of organizational readiness, you know, how you, how you make it work for you, client support, follow-up. Arc Sciences has veterinarians that, if you have a problem, can help you, um, you know. So there are a number of things, and, and Brian's here from Arc Sciences, and I'm happy to answer questions afterwards. I've been told that they will beat me to a pulp if I go over, so. Um, a single virtually painless injection to sterilize a male dog permanently. That's a new tool for your toolbox, so. Why do we neuter dogs? Somebody gets an A because they answered it. They said, to control reproduction, so. All right. I always put this slide in, I love it. It reminds me of, of you know, how we treat animals uh, says a lot about who we are. All right, finally, I'm done.